Hi, today I'm gonna show you 6 tips for better and cleaner code in GDScript in Godot 4. Why only 6? Because I couldn't come up with a 7th tip, so maybe there will be a part 2 of this. Also, you may already know some of these tips and some of them are really basic, but just applying them to your scripts can do a lot in terms of cleaner and more readable code. I've prepared this example script and with this I'm just gonna show you the tips I have prepared. Okay, so number one, be consistent with your formatting. This is an array and this is an array as well, but here all of the elements of the array are in one line, while here they are spaced out over multiple lines. So let's just fix that and make this consistent. Obviously you could put the elements of the second array into one line or space out the elements of the first array onto multiple lines. I'm gonna opt for the first one and just fix the first array. Okay, so I think this looks just a lot more readable in general compared to having them in one line, but also the consistency you get that each array looks kind of the same and you can instantly tell, oh, this is an array, is kind of nice. So another formatting thing is just adding spaces between certain lines, for example, before declaring an array, because this just makes stuff way more readable, like this. And then the next thing is, it kinda doesn't matter how many lines you add between your functions, but just keep it consistent. For example, here I've got one empty line between my functions, so I usually use two lines, so let's just do that. Okay, already a lot more readable. Another thing that can make your script hard to read is having random indents in your script. So let's just remove them, for example this one can go and this one can go as well. Now it already looks a lot more clean. Also with comments in your script, be consistent whether you add a space directly after the hashtag or not. And also one thing I noticed here is that the first letter after the hashtag is in lowercase here, while here it's in uppercase. Okay, so I would argue that you could already stop here and the whole script is a lot more readable than before, but you can go a lot of steps further into cleaner and more readable code. Number two is adding variable type hints. So if you don't know, GDScript by default is dynamically typed, which means that every variable will not have a type and the interpreter will figure it out at runtime. This of course comes at a small performance cost, but you also lose type related autocompletes in the script editor. So for example, I've got this variable default speed here, which is obviously a float. So let's just add a type hint. You add a type to a variable by doing colon and then adding the type. So in this example, a float. And then let's just do this for all of the variables in our script. So int, this is another int. And this is another int. So with arrays, type hints can get a bit more complicated. Let me show you. So basically you just tell the engine, oh, this is an array by adding colon array. But you know how you can put a string or a float or an integer into an array. So if you have an array with only one type, like these two, you can do an open square bracket and then specify the type of the elements in the array. So for example, string. And now this is an array that only contains strings. So same down here, let me just copy this over. Now one thing you might have noticed is that this limits you to only having strings in your array. So for example, if I add a new element with a type of integer, one, it will error me that an array with a type of string cannot contain an integer. So sadly you can't have multiple types in your array. So for example I can't do int as a second type. So you just have to go with an untyped array if you want to have elements of multiple types in your array. Like this. Also type hints do not only benefit you in terms of performance but also in terms of readability. So for example if I make the integer running speed a float it will give me a warning down here in your script warnings just click to expand that it will convert this float to an integer. Same goes if I assign an integer to a float. Really nothing will happen because you can also represent one as 1.0. Just note that there will be no problems if you do some maths with floats and the result 
is an integer, you can still assign an integer to a float basically. It's kinda confusing, but it also makes programming a lot easier and is kinda nice honestly. So let's say I want to assign the result of bar to a save margin of the player. So I can do save margin equals bar. And then I have to pass in two arguments. Let's just do 1.4 and 3. You can also apply variable type ins to function parameters. For example, you could say this is an integer and this is a float. And now it will also tell you that you will lose some precision in your float because it will be converted to an integer. So let's just fix this by, for example, just making this 1, which is an integer, and the warning has gone away. Okay, so the third thing also has to do with type ins, but instead of variable type ins, you can also add function return type ins. So here I'm assigning the result of calculate movement speed to velocity, velocity being of course a vector 3. And so now here in calculate movement speed, I can now add the type that the function should return. So the way to add return type ins in GDScript is you make an arrow out of a dash and a greater than, and then you specify the type. For example, I want this to return a vector 3, because obviously I want to assign it to velocity. So let's just do vector 3. So now it will tell me, oh, you're returning a value of type float, but the return type of the function is vector3. Obviously this is on purpose because I wanted to show you how adding type ins can catch errors before running the program. Well, let's just fix this by returning a vector3. And so yeah, now the error has gone away and the program would not crash when running it because the return type matches the variable type. So I'm gonna add the return type of float to my function bar because one of the parameters is a float so it is likely that the result of arg1 and arg2 is gonna be a float as well. So let's just add this type and float and voila there we go. So the fourth thing I wanted to show you is to not use magic values in your code. Magic values, if you don't know, are random parameters in your code, like for example this integer 1 or 3 here. And the downside of having magic values is you don't exactly know what these values do. For example, you don't know what is 1, why is it 1, and same goes here, why the frick is there a 3 here. Which, especially if you're coming back to this code after like a week or two, it can be really hard to know why exactly these values are here. So one thing you can do is add a variable with a descriptive name and just set the value of the variable to your magic value. So let's just do this. For example, var bar arg1 of type int is equal to 1 and var bar arg2 of type int is equal to 3. And now instead of having a random 1 here, you can pass bar arg1 and bar arg2 into the function. Obviously in a real script you would have a really descriptive name here, but I'm keeping my example generic on purpose, so just know that you wouldn't name your variables function name arg1 and function name arg2 and so on and so forth, but you would give them a descriptive name. Same goes here, in my calculate movement speed function, I'm multiplying default speed times 15. Let's just say 15 would be my acceleration. So let's just do var acceleration of type int is 15. And then we can just copy this into here. And the code becomes way more readable because we are multiplying default speed times acceleration and not default speed times 15. Also a small tip, you could argue that this makes changing parameters more slow, but not really. You can hold control and click on the variable name and it will instantly put your text cursor to the value of the variable. So I could change this to let's say 4 and it would instantly apply. And obviously you also get all of the nice things variables come with, for example reusability or changing the value. You couldn't really change the value acceleration before because you would have to have a bunch of if statements and it would have become really messy blah blah blah. So just not have magic values in your code. Also there's a bit of an argument going on whether it's okay to have zero as a magic value or not. I think it is okay because mostly zero is just there to have no effect on something. 
so I think that's fine. But you could of course replace this with a variable with a descriptive name that would be fine as well. So talking about replacing magic values in your code is a perfect transition to the next topic, which is use constants if you can. So a constant, if you not know, is basically like a variable, it can have a type and obviously a value, but you can't change it at runtime. This can be a bad thing, but it can also be a good thing and make your code more readable and you also get a small performance gain. I'm gonna just show you with bar argument one and bar argument two. So really you just replace the variable keyword with the const keyword. You could either use this case for the variable names or you could go all uppercase, which I'm gonna do because I'm used to that. Small tip, you can mark the text you want to make uppercase. Go to edit, convert case, uppercase, or you could also press shift f4 and now obviously it's gonna throw an error at us these values do not exist so let's just copy the right names over and this will basically do the same thing the nice thing with having the names of constants in uppercase is that you can instantly tell okay this is a constant and this is a variable so you won't run into situations where you try to assign a value to a constant in your script and speaking of magic values, I also think that having a node path in your script is a magic value because this could change. If I now would rename camera 3D to let's say FPS camera 3D, it's gonna throw an error at me because camera 3D does not exist anymore. It's now called FPS camera 3D. So I would have to remove that and drag this back into here. And now it would run. But there's a way to make this way more easier, being able to rename your nodes and they will dynamically update in your script. So the next thing I want to show you, use unique names over direct node path, on ready variables over unique names and export variables over on ready variables. So you may know how you can right click on a node in your node tree and select access as unique name. And then if you drag the variable into your script, it will have a percent sign rather than a dollar sign in front of it. This is useful and better than having a direct node path because you won't have to have the whole node path. Just to show you, I added a whole bunch of bullshit nodes into my scene tree here. So if I drag this navigation agent 3D into my code, it will give me a long, long node path, which will take up a whole line. Obviously you can shorten this with a unique name. And you can just drag this in and you will just have navigation aid in 3D here instead of this whole node path. But there's an even better way to do this. Let me just get rid of all of this shit here. So you probably know about onready variables. In case you don't, let me just show you. I usually declare them over all of my variables. So let's do add onready var call it FPS camera. Make it of type camera 3D and then drag in our FPS camera 3D here. Or you could of course also add a unique node here just to have it a bit more clean. And now we can just replace this direct node path down here with our variable and it will do the same thing but just way more cleaner. And also with the benefit of if I for example want to change another parameter of this camera, I can just do FPS camera again, point, I don't know, let's say current is equal to true and I wouldn't have to drag in my camera again and again or copy this and I would have a bunch of get node statements in my script which would hurt performance because these two things basically are short for get node and then the name of the node which is not really good for poor performance so just use on ready variables instead but what if i have my node path here for example and rename this camera to tps camera 3d because i want to make my game third person now it's not going to show up as a warning in the editor but if i run this scene it's going to crash and tell me oh invalid set index fov on base null instance with value of type int why is this well, it's because this is just the name of the node, right? And there is no node. If you remember, if I would do get node and then say FPS camera 3D, there is no node with this name. So same here. I would have to go in, delete this and drag in TPS camera. And now if I run this, it will run just fine and don't throw any errors at me. But there's a better way to do this. 
Instead of add on ready variables, use export variables. Just remove the value you're assigning to it and then go into your inspector and you will see all of your exported variables here. You can just click on assign here and then select the node, double click it or click OK down here. And now it will work just fine if I run this. Nothing will happen, no crashes, no warnings, no nothing. And the nice thing is if I go into this node and oh I want to have my character controller first person again. I can just rename this to FPS camera 3D. And if I now click on my player, go into the inspector, you see it has dynamically updated and FPS camera now points to the node FPS camera. By the way, you won't get this export thing here and it will throw an error at you if you remove the type -ins. so you always have to add type -ins to your exported variables and it will tell you that you cannot use an export annotation with a variable without a type or initializer since type can't be inferred. So let's just do camera 3D again and we're fine. So I think if we now go into full screen, close the output down here and zoom out a bit so we can see the whole thing. This is a whole lot cleaner than what we had before and a whole lot more readable and more reusable. And if you come back to this in two weeks, you won't bang your head against the wall because you don't understand shit anymore. You'll probably still have to look at it for like a few seconds to figure out what the script is doing but it's more readable, it's cleaner, and you will not bang your head against your wall anymore, trust me. Okay, yeah, so thanks for watching this. I will include this example script in the description, just if you want to copy something out of it. I don't really know why you would want to do this, but in case you want it, that's fine. So thanks for watching, leave a like, subscribe, and see ya.